a template. So we'll, like for, for example, endocrine, you're not going to have a ton of questions, maybe one to three, definitely a good chapter to read. These are the main things that we want you to focus on. You don't need to flashcard every single one in the back. I think it is more like uh, big blocks and little blocks. So a big block would be these are chapters that you really should focus on. And that's going to be like chapter 10, which we'll get into here soon. And, and chapter 12, which gets into like this first question here. So we try to put those types of questions into the summary so we can get uh, more competent with it and just kind of dance around in all areas. Because as the exam is, you will, you'll see is it's not just like, oh, it's going to be chapter one for five questions and chapter three for five questions. It's all over the place. And so, Brock, you want to start us off with this one? Yeah, yeah. So just uh, just to get started before I uh, just a little piggyback on what Chris was starting to call with earlier. Like, yeah, we also uh, within the next two, one to two weeks, probably two weeks, definitely want to have um, I'm going to have someone who recently took the CSCS on uh, just because I obviously we're, you know, we're here to help as much as we can. And a part of that help is getting somebody with even a fresher brain on it than we may have. So I'm going to have somebody that, you know, recently took it, took it in past just so you can, you know, if, if you have any questions that rings off just for formatting. You know, uh, you know their their approach will give it to you, and then uh, also probably when we when we go over the nutrition chapters, which are nine and ten, gonna have a, a RD registered dietitian on who uh, she has worked with three Division One uh, college programs uh, in, in just about every sport. The main ones: football, basketball, soccer, baseball. But uh, she's worked at U, uh, UCF, Central Florida, Wake Forest, as well as Clemson. And so uh, definitely. Uh, just, just so you all can kind of, you know, throw any question and hear some of her experience when working with these athletes from a nutrition standpoint and how she teamed up with the strength and conditioning coaches through, through that process. All right, so we'll start off with our question. Our first one that we like to start everyone out with is uh, more of a case example. We have a 19-year-old female basketball player, can bench 125, squat 205, and has a VO2 max of 38 milliliters and kilogram a minute. What would she want to work on the most in the offseason? We have A, upper and lower body strength, B, upper body strength only, C, BO2 max. We'll see. Uh, C. All right, we got a B, we got a C. Any other answers? Do we know her weight? Because <laughs> if she weighs like 85 pounds and is benching 125, that's pretty good, right? Alan? But if she's but if she's a uh, weighs 150 pounds, you can only bench 120 pounds. Not that good, right? All right. So this is uh, great. This is great. I, li I like this uh, ch this conversation because yeah, sometimes again, sometimes they might not. The question may not include all the factors. Like it might not include a vert. It might not include her weight. So then at that point, it's important to go look at the chart, which is kind of what we uh, going back to that numbers chart we've talked about. Uh, 295. Yeah. You said 395, right? 295, 295. 295. So we have we have that chart and we go to it. You will see that just for a 19-year-old basketball player, 125 is a good bench. It's fine. I'm pretty uh what percentile do you have it up right now, Chris? That's 95%, 90%. Yeah, 90 percentile. So again, I like where your thought process is at it with the weight, but at the same time, when you look at question relevance, you also want to, you know, kind of remember those factors. And again, if they don't mention the weight. You want to just go to the, the numbers. Her bench and squat looks fine, which is going to, you know, lead me, again, to, the, the, to see uh, which is correct. So th 38. So, again, a 19-year-old, uh, you know, female collegiate athlete, especially playing a sport that's going to be, you know, anaerobic, anaerobic, like a sport like basketball, she's definitely going to want to be a, above 38. Um, you know, any anytime you see a number under 40 for college athletes, more than likely that number is going to be, be low, but especially when you consider us uh, – a sport uh, like basketball with kind of consistent movement, you definitely want that to be closer to 50 or above. I think for a lot of the, the, the guys that work with males, when you start looking at these numbers, you know, I made this, this you know, mistake in the beginning too, thinking that, oh, those numbers aren't that bad. But when you actually start seeing girls bench, you're like I've only had three girls in my whole entire life that I've witnessed bench 135. And they were like badass chicks. <laughs> And so 125, that's, you know, that's a 35 on each side and a five. That's a good amount of weight. And just think about when you go to the gym, obviously it's not the same, but you don't see a lot of girls with a 45 and a 35 just repping out squats. Um, so, you know, those are, those are pretty good numbers. It's the ones that will kind of screw us in our mind is we're looking at VO2 max and we're thinking, shit, I've probably never done that test before. So all I know is recognize this number and 38, what the fuck does that mean? 
And so then we kind of get hung up on, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's this one, maybe it's that one. So, you know, if you just really just get into the chart on 295 and go through the different um, for these ones, the, the male ones, as you're going to see as the weeks go by, those ones are pretty easy, I think, but it's the, it's the female ones that will kind of throw a curveball at you. Exactly. All right. Number two, which endocrine, which endocrine gland, gland secretes growth hormone? We have our we have kidney, adrenal cortex, and to anterior pituitary gland. Yeah. B. What did we say? C or B? We said B. I couldn't hear that last one. C. No, I see. Any other answers? Going with the group. I'm going to see. <laughs> All right, C is correct. Does anybody want to take a stab? You know, at what? Uh, you know, what? What is the uh, anterior pituitary gland? Well, one of the things it does is to create growth hormone. Does anybody else know the purpose of it? It's major part during puberty. Yes, yes, it's a major major part during during puberty. It produces it produces and sends a lot. It secretes a lot of these hormones. So again, growth hormone is a very important one, which is probably the most important when you're talking about uh, puberty and growth. Uh, you have some other ones such as the adrenal cortical, adrenal cortical tropic, I always mess that word up, um, luteinizing hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, prolactin. So anterior, it, it produces all these hormones, releases them uh, to the blood screen, which, uh, which, is what, uh, which is what endocrine glands do in general. They're the ones that are for your longer processes. Sending um sending these hormones through the bloodstream and uh if you go if you look in those flashcard notes we uh we talk about how it's important to know the difference between the autocrine, paracrine and the endocrine gland gland so the endocrine gland is going to be the one where you're seeing the hormones get sent through the bloodstream but that's the longest process whereas autocrine is a gland that can send signals to itself or nearby uh or or another uh, cell that's similar to it. Whereas paracrine is going to be, uh, it, it's going to send to another, a different cell, but it has to be in the vicinity. Endocrine are sending signals and hormones to uh, things that are farther away through the bloodstream. All right. Three, which of the following re resistance training loads is most effective for increasing serum testosterone concentration in boys and younger men? A, 85 to 95, B, 75 to 85, C, 50 to 75. A. A. All right. A. A is correct. So this is a good one. Um, and then, and and this is key. It's uh, does anybody? Why? Why did you all? If someone wants to answer, why did y'all uh decide to go with A? Highest A. percentage. Most intensity. Most intensity. All right. Exactly. Any other? Any other reasons? Just right. uh, heavier load for increasing testosterone. More recruitment of everything. Exactly. Bingo. You, you, you all are on point. So it's important to think. I've seen, I've had someone before kind of get tricked with that because they're like, well, what about what about 75 to 85? That's more hypertrophy. Some people might be getting tricked into thinking of that, that, high, that more. That right. more that hey, high, high, but again, strength is going to always, because of, like you said, the neural, the neural effects is going to all, like again, we we you we, we talk about strength and the neural drain, the firing recruit. If, if something's firing and recruiting, it's likely that more hormones are going to be involved. So yes, the more the higher the intensity is going to always be uh, increasing serum testosterone compared to the lower lower intensity. So good job there. And then finally, uh, before I give it back to Chris, which of the following hormones will be released due to higher lactate concentrations? We have A, IGF one, B. Growth hormone C IGF two. Uh, B. Got a B. Any other answers? I'm changing to A. I don't know if I can do that, but I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Hey, on the test, you can. Any other answers? <laughs> uh, hey man, my, my man should have stayed. Uh, stayed. Uh, actually, no, you were wrong. Uh, no, no, no. I said my man, you should have stuck with uh, your first answer because it is B. So, do you know what uh, IGF one and two are? I don't. 
I well, not enough to tell you what they are now. <laughs> so again, you uh, those are those are insulin like uh, insulin like growth factors. Uh, you know, those are insulin based. Again, I, and I'll let if Chris wants to explain it a little more. I'll let, I let I always just I just know they're insulin based. They're more ho hormones. So this is more of a muscular. So they, you know, lactate. Again, lac lactate is more of a you know a, a response to something muscular. Lac lactate is, is a response to that. And again, so uh, exercise. So it's pretty much think think of the stress. Think of the stress of exercising. Like we're um, so going when you're going through exercise, we increase lactate concentration because as we talked about last week when we're getting into bioenergetics, uh, la that lactate is produced you know after the ATP is born, after our anaerobic processes are burned. And so exercise uh, growth hormones it is, is increased post workout as a as a positive response to exercise. Um, you know again, so that is a that's a positive response. So that lactate concentration happens after we do anaerobic, anaerobic work. So weightlifting, growth hormone is uh is what's in response. Chris, you want to uh, touch on what uh, insulin growth factor is and why why there's a difference there? I want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to piggyback off of growth hormone in response to lactate, this is a a lot of evidence has been digging deeper into this due to blood flow restriction training. It's probably something you're not going to do with your athletes. Are you guys familiar with that? Mm -hmm. so it's like when you you tape off your arm at the armpit and you get like a voodoo wrap and then you do like a super super slow bicep curl and so what it does is it sh it shuts down the arterial blood flow to the muscles and it allows for venous return so you just do it enough where you get this pooling effect and that pooling effect is going to accumulate larger concentrations of lactate and then your brain is going to release more growth hormone and so they're not quite sure if it's due to the weight and the amount of repetitions or if it's because of the metabolic stress. And those would be things that Dr. Schoenfeld will be able to explain in, in greater detail when we chat with him. But that's where this one's going off of with the higher lactate threshold. So I think it's just that burn when you get that burn. It's also something that's called growth hormone induced vomiting. And so when you kick the shit out of your athletes and, you know, they've had a, a terrible game, they lost by 30 and you just run them to the to a pulp and they someone maybe throw up. That is due to that accumulation of those hormones. And what's a growth like factor is a anabolic hormone uh, one. I'm, I couldn't tell you the difference between one and two, but these are anabolic hormones. They're actually this is where if, if you've ever heard about like deer antler velvet. That's where it, it's, it can be found in the copious amounts. And so like they'll, you'll see stuff at like GNC, you'll say, get this deer, ant deer antler velvet, which is bullshit. You know, you'd have to have like 40 deer antlers to be able to get enough of that anabolic hormone. Um, that's all I, re I can really tell you about it, but that's the instant growth like factor is an anabolic hormone. So we'll get into number five, which of the following regulates kidney functioning, permeability and reabsorption of water prolactin, insulin, and antidiuretic hormone. C. C. Final answer. Jimmy? Yeah, I go C. Yep. Group, group effort there. Nice. So it would be C. Insulin, obviously, is going to be and, and due to the um, glucose, prolactin is uh, lactate, uh, sorry, not lactate, uh, uh, breast milk and stuff for women. Antidiuretic hormone is, is based off of the kidney functioning. 